The idea of science-based dog training is often reduced to the methods you use, are you force-free or do you apply aversive control? But being science-driven goes far beyond training techniques. Everyone who shares a home with a dog makes hundreds of small decisions every day. What to feed, how long to exercise, which treats to buy, whether to choose medication, a nail clipper or a dremel, even down to the type of shampoo. I want to share the strategies I follow in building a lifestyle with my three dogs and how science has helped me optimize their overall well-being. When people ask me what it's like living with three dogs, I usually just say busy, very busy. But for me, it's also a constant experiment. Every day I'm observing, testing, adjusting and learning because no two dogs are ever the same. Over time, I've built a routine and lifestyle that works for us, guided by scientific concepts that helped me focus on what really matters. That doesn't mean it's the only way or even the right way for you, but my hope is that what I share this video gives you something useful and you can decide how much of it fits into your own life. Let's get into it. Number one, social connection. Most of my time is spent at home with three big dogs and a cat. And in a small house, let's just say if everyone had their way, it would be chaos. Like us, dogs are social creatures. They need connection, but they also need solitude. New scientists actually have a word for this, social homeostasis. It's the brain's way of measuring how much social contact you're getting, comparing it to a kind of set point and then nudging you to seek more or less. Too little feels bad, too much feels overwhelming. And after a while, the brain adapts to a new set point where constant interaction, for example, is the new normal and anything less becomes almost aversive, leading to separation anxiety and a Velcro dog. Since I work from home, I've had to get creative about balancing togetherness and separation. Sometimes they're with me, but can not climb all over me because they're in a playpen or on a dog bed. Other times they're resting in another room by themselves and then there are moments when we, of course, fully engage with each other. What I came to realize is that dogs with the loudest emotions benefit most from this variety. It keeps them from becoming dependent on constant input from me and helps them expand that so-called set point of social homeostasis so they can handle more solitude and more connection without tipping into stress. Number two, nutrition. Nutrition is one of the biggest levers we have for our dog's well-being. But if you're anything like me, it's easy to get overwhelmed. The internet is full of advice, the pet industry promises shiny fur and strong joints, and honestly, half the time it just leaves you stuck because there are too many choices and decisions to be made. I realized I needed a starting point, something simple to anchor my decisions. So I went back to the basics, the three macronutrients, protein, fat, and carbohydrates. Dogs don't actually need carbohydrates to survive. There is no need for carbohydrates in their food, but there is a metabolic requirement for glucose. Unlike cats, dogs have the enzymes to metabolize carbohydrates, so technically they can eat it. But feeding a diet with a carbohydrate content of 30 to 60%, like most kibble have, that never made sense to me. So I don't avoid kibble completely, but I don't make it the foundation of their diet either. Now fat, on the other hand, is a dog's main energy source. It can come from animal or plant products and it's where I pay the most attention if a dog needs to lose or gain weight. Instead of just feeding less or more, I'll look for food with lower or higher fat content. And then there is protein, of course. It's not just about having protein in their diet, it's about digestibility. Research shows that protein from eggs and fresh meat 
is absorbed much better than highly processed sources. That's why most of my dog's diet is raw, supplemented with some baked kibble for the little crunch, the occasional veggies and fruits for fibers, and always a squeeze of omega-3s for brain health. For me, it's not about chasing the perfect diet. It's about understanding the basics and making small intentional choices that keep my dog's bodies and brains thriving. And number three, healthy aging. Cognitive decline is one of those inevitable byproducts of aging in dogs, just as it is in us. Research shows that the first signs can emerge as early as seven years of age. But here's the hopeful part. The brain is remarkably responsive to what we do with it. Two of the most powerful tools we have to delay the onset of canine dementia are consistent physical exercise and novelty in the dog's life. The brain depends on constant signals that new ones are still needed that learning is still happening. Without that stimulation, the high metabolic cost of maintaining neurons, especially in memory hubs like the hippocampus, is no longer justified and cells begin to die off. Most people immediately think of enrichment as the solution. And yes, puzzle feeders and button games are better than nothing, but they only scratch the surface. Dogs were designed to move, to explore, and to interpret the world with their whole body. The most powerful stimulation comes from real-life adventures. The sensation of dirt, pebbles, or sand under their paws, the smell of morning fog, or maybe even autumn decay, the discovery of critter holes along the trail. It's this kind of multi-sensory input, the touch, the smell, sight, sound, movement, that tells the brain through every available channel that life is still happening and worth keeping the neurons online for. So I try to give my dogs little adventures. I get up a little bit earlier, once or twice or three times a week to drive out somewhere they haven't seen yet. I don't always go the same routine. I allow them to sniff a little longer in areas they haven't been there before. This is a new route. We've never been here before. And I think Harvey very much enjoys exploring all these new smells and sights and sounds. I try to make it novel, exciting adventures as much as I can. And that's really the point here, isn't it? Science isn't just a collection of facts or methods to debate online. It's a lens we can use to shape everyday choices from how we feed to how we rest to how we move and connect. Living with dogs is never perfect. It's messy, sometimes frustrating, of course, and often maybe chaotic. But science gives me a compass to navigate all the mess with a little more clarity. And in the end, it's not about creating a flawless system. It's about building a life for us and for our dogs that feels intentional, balanced, and is worth showing up for every single day. That's it for today. I'm Dr. Melanie and I'll see you in the next one.